It's a sunny day over here. Uh, my name is Kwabna Chenje Inibati. I'm grateful you've made time to join us for yet another edition of 21 Minutes with KKB. Today, I'm bringing to you an educationist, someone who has done this for a long time, virtually her entire life. She's uh, been through the mill, she's been through the system, and she's actually served as Minister of Education of this great Republic of Ghana. I return in Ejifi to introduce my guests for today. Stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us here on 21 Minutes with KKB. Professor Nana Jaino Pokwajiman, I'm sure a lot of you, <laughs> that name rings a lot of bells when, when you do hear that very name. But yes, she uh, was a Minister for Education uh, in the Eswa Mahama administration, and today she happens to be my guest on 21 Minutes with KKB. Madam, good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> very good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot I want to talk about, but maybe let me just <laughs> <laughs> start with this. Uh, 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 where have you been? We, we don't hear from you. We don't see you nowadays. What, what, what are you doing now? I'm doing so many things. Okay. Um, one of them, I'm chairing the Forum for African Women Educationalists. Okay. We are headquartered in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. We focus on the education of girls and women in Africa. Okay. We operate in 33 African countries and... I am the Africa board chair okay. for that. Um, it's a Pan-African NGO. Oh, okay. uh, apart from that, I'm also doing a lot of writing. <laughs> um, I haven't had a lot of time to do the kind of writing I want to do mm. because after my term as vice chancellor, I moved into the ministry and both positions were, um, let me say time consuming. Okay. Yes, that's what they were. Uh, I'm also uh, working for the University of Cape Coast, where else should I go back to? <laughs> um, helping with many things uh, in the faculty and in the university. And so all these keep me quite busy. The very first female vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, I'm sure, say, of course, it's a, it's a very big achievement. But I was going through some of your things as well. And I wrote two pages of achievements and laurels here and there. So many things. Uh, well, let me start. Let me just read a few, right? So uh, I'm seeing here. You went to Wesley Girls? I didn't even know yes, that. Yes, I did. You were a senior prefect as well. I there. did, yes. Okay. I was. Quite, quite a lot of things I, I see here suggesting, you know what, you've done a lot. You've seen a lot. You've experienced a lot, particularly in the field of education. But some time back, we had a, a minister come out to say, well, you didn't know what you were doing at the education ministry. <laughs> I'm sure you heard that. <laughs> oh, yes, I heard that. Is uh, it, so is that the case? You didn't know what you were doing there? Oh, well, according to him, and uh, he's entitled to his opinion. But what, what came to mind when you heard, uh, well, a medical practitioner who had been put, to, put in, uh, in the education ministry, when you heard him say that the educationists didn't know what she was doing there? Well, what I expected was that um, as somebody who had taken over from me, would have opportunity to work together. But if that wasn't the case, uh, it didn't really bother me. He cites a number of things that probably weren't wrong, but let's, since you are here, you were the education minister at the time. Take us through what it is that was done uh, during your era. I'm sure a lot of things did come up about, the, of course, the e-blog, the three-year, four-year system, and quite a lot. But I would leave you to take us through what really happened during your tenure as education minister. All right, um, I came to the ministry um, convinced that education has many levels. It has also has many types. I, to propose an image, I'll uh, propose the image of a chain. Okay. And we know that a chain is as strong as its weakest link. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in the past, and not only in this country, but elsewhere too, if you even look at the MDGs, you'll see that MDG on education was focusing on primary education. And I remember uh, um, ending up as a member of the executive board of UNESCO and posing this question, that the MDG started in 2000. They were supposed to uh, end 2015. So the child who went to primary school at age six would be 21. So that told me that, no, by focusing on primary school, we're losing so many things. Because a child wasn't going to stay in primary school for 15 years and 
nobody or uh, no, no nation use only primary school graduates to build the nation and therefore even as you concentrated on primary schools you mustn't lose sight of the other sectors actually your attention should go to all of them at once okay. because they are all linked so that was a thinking with which I entered the ministry so we paid attention to preschool we paid attention to primary school um, and at the primary school level the focus was on the public schools that were not doing so well the ones that we have the temerity to call side to they are our own children they are our own people yeah. and the belief for me is that every child is capable and every child deserves a chance so if we know if you go to a school and you see that even the infrastructure <laughs> is off-putting they are learning in the sun or in the rain or you know at the mercy of the weather you know they don't have teachers or they don't have qualified teachers they don't have books then clearly you know that the results will not be good yeah. so you make notes of all these and you fix them you continue to the ghs to see what is going on there to the shs and then after the shs we know that they branch into many areas some go to vocational schools yeah. Some go to technical schools, some continue, let me, for lack of better expression, say the mainstream. After this level, some stop, some go into the workplace. How do they enter the workplace? How do they acquire their skills? And those who continue, what really, what is going on at the entire spectrum of education that we have in this country? So I thought that our our approach should be holistic. We should be looking at everything, both horizontally and vertically. And that is what we try to do at the ministry. It's, it's critical you make mention of schools and the trees particularly. I mean, the, how a lot of students had to, uh, of course, upon your assumption of office, you realize a lot of these students were studying in very uncomfortable conditions. And, and so um, it was an opportunity to put up structures that were good enough to house these students. Now, one of the issues that has come up, particularly some of the things the critics have said, is that, well, you use that as an opportunity, or the NDC government used that as an opportunity to inflate costs and build very huge, gargantuan and humongous <laughs> structures that have been put in villages and are not even being put to use. <laughs> well, and um, that it was a complete waste of the, <laughs> the taxpayers' money. Let me start with the uh, senior secondary school, the e-blocks, yes, because the I've e heard that comment. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to note that we did the e blocks from two sources, from Government of Ghana sources and from World Bank sources. Okay. We did everything with the World Bank. And in fact, finally, you, you will even find, if you get the figures, that in some cases, even our costs were lower than World Bank costs. So because we, had, we were working with the World Bank and they were also interested in the loan they were giving mm -hmm. us and the uses to which we were putting them, Talking about inflation affects them too. And I'm not sure if uh, that is what exactly happened. We did the costing with them. In fact, at some point, they even sent us an expert from DC to come and help our quantity surveyors. So we all agreed on the, on the cost. Mm -hmm. There will be variations because sometimes it depends on the distance. It also depends on the state of the land. If uh, somebody has to I don't know, build a road, if somebody has to fill some land to make it even, whatever it is. But all of these were studied and the margins were determined. So I'm not sure about it being uh, inflicted <laughs> and, uh, in villages where there, there's no use. And let me explain that. Okay. We have a youthful population. So every year we have more people than uh, the year before. Mm -hmm. And education also helps with democracy, it helps with social equity. If you cite all the schools in the cities, you inconvenience those in the rural areas. But, but with a school, let's say a school of, with a capacity of about 1,500 people being sent to a community of 200 people. No, I, I'm not sure of that. I'm Please g give me an example. <laughs> I, 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 I may not <laughs> be able to give you specifics, but recently we spoke to another educationist, Professor Steve, uh, Adair, and he raised a very key issue as far as this is concerned. And, well, he went as far as suggesting that most of the buildings that had been put in these rural areas were useless. They were a complete waste of resources. Well, I, I, I will not agree because we did a lot of homework before the sites were chosen. 
according to the um, to the um, to the act that established the district assemblies, each one each district must have a secondary school. Mm. And I think the districts are set up, it's not the ministry that does it, I'm not trying to pass the buck, <laughs> but the districts are done with population in mind. And if that is so, then I'm not aware of a district with 200 people. So, uh, so uh, when we started, we prioritized the districts, new districts were created by both governments. We prioritized the districts that had no secondary schools. And in choosing where the schools should be cited, it wasn't the priority of the ministry as such. Okay. We could only make suggestions because the ministry didn't have land. So we had to work with the district or municipal assemblies or whatever the case might be. They will go to the chiefs who own the land and they will tell us that in terms of the, of the space you want, this is where the land would be. We also looked at the distribution of, of junior high schools in the area. Okay, and all of these went into the siting of the schools. All right, so I think that it was a concerted effort, the chiefs, the assembly, the schools. We worked a lot with the census people, the statistic people to get to know the, the population of the district and then also the mapping of the district and to determine where we are going to have the land. We asked for big pieces of land because we know that the schools will be expanded someday. Mm. And so um, that was the land that the chiefs could give us. But, but why, why was the focus on community day senior high schools? The focus was on community, uh, community day schools for the reason that if you looked at any child's bill, any person's bill mm -hmm. from the senior secondary schools, you'll notice that the, bo the boarding fee was the highest. Okay, that was the biggest. Mm. And that was also a reason that somebody might or might not go to school. We argue that, yes, it's nice for everybody to be in boarding school, but that wasn't a good reason why you shouldn't go to secondary school at all. I was thinking that insofar as the person has been able to go to um, a, a day junior high school, it's still secondary. The junior high school is secondary education. Mm. So you've done half as a day student, it ought to be possible for the same person to complete it in the day system rather than not go to school at all. And it's not just the boarding fee, it's the trunk, it's, you know, it's all the preparation that the parents must make, provisions and so on. And all of these were prohibitive to a lot of our people. Therefore, the plan was to try to remove the cost barriers to, uh, to um, senior secondary education. And that explained why it was in a day school, why we thought of day schools first. Mm. Yes. So uh, the plan was, for instance, that after these day schools have been put up, we are going to get some more money to put up a, a few more structures, which may necessarily have uh, boarding facilities and the like. Perhaps no, that was the thinking. Actually, at the time, the boarding wasn't a priority for us. Oh, what, okay. was prior what was prioritized was that the day school should have all the ancillary facilities it needed for quality education to occur. Okay. That was our priority. So as I said at the beginning, we built from, we built from two sources, mm -hmm. the government of Ghana sources and the World Bank forces, sources. So what we did was to spread the World Bank sources across the country to serve as models. Those that we built with the World Bank money, we also included the headmaster's bungalow, teacher's flats, a canteen, a workshop, you know, some may be vocational students, okay. some may be technical students, and so on. We thought everybody must have, each of these World Bank funded schools must have everything. And along with that too, uh, we, uh, the benefit was that it had allowed us to provide the special use of the land. Even if all you have is an is a e-block, it still has enough the school to run and we were in discussion with the communities the assemblies the churches the chiefs to help us house the teachers yes it would be nice to have the boarding facility but we also knew that the boarding schools were the reasons why a lot of the children were not going okay so uh 
to sum up, the World Bank funded ones, and it's not as if they were, uh, well, they were also government <laughs> money, <laughs> but I'm just showing the source from yeah, which yeah, yeah. that mm. came. And it allowed us to use the space to set an example of how the others could be developed. So for you, those schools are not useless? I don't see how, they, how any investment in education can be useless. Mm -hmm. I think investment in education is good. From the time of Kwame Nkrumah, it used to be about 40% of our budget. Subsequent governments, every government in this country has played a very good role in investing very, very heavily in education. According to the UNESCO guideline, every government must invest at least 20%. I'm not sure if we've ever hit low, hit that low. We've always gone even about 30%. Mm. And for a very good reason, you see, you are investing in the future of your own population. <laughs> you, you can't be stingy about it. Definitely don't have infinite amounts of money. Mm -hmm. But to think that a country like Ghana can put that amount into education is very, very laudable. Mm. But you'll also notice when you look at the 40% and you convert it back into 100%, then you ask yourself, where does the money go? You realize that, yes, a lot is going into payment of salaries. Of course, you should pay teachers. Uh, so you don't have enough going into infrastructural okay. development. You mm. don't have enough into equipment supply. You don't have enough into teacher development. That's very important. And you may not have enough into even innovative ways of teaching the same subject. All these cost money. So if that is the case, you ask yourself, so what do we do? How do, we, how do you ensure that the quality measures are, are met? Okay, so, so uh, investment in education. <laughs> Uh, I, I will never call it. Uh, call, you never call it useless. Yeah. Okay. There was also an issue about uh, the uh, during your time, three-year system, four-year system. Or it was a three-year system. We, we, we moved to a four-year system, and then we had to bring it back to a three-year system. And well, now we are being told of some other systems. But of course, we'll talk about those ones later. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, is it not that you politician or you? Are, technically, you're not a politician, but you play the role of a politician at one point in time. But you're just toying with the futures of our children. You see, I'll ask the question. When was the GHS system uh, introduced? And for how long did we run the three-year system? And what has occasioned the four-year system? Mm -hmm. uh, for some of us, we like to look at data. We like to look at performance. We like to look at research outputs mm -hmm. so that we can make uh, decisions that may not necessarily be accepted by all, but at least you will come to understand why we made that decision. Yeah. So if there's a report that says that, oh, now we are getting, um, I don't know, bad products, and that the extra time, among which options, will fix that problem, you know. But when I moved to the ministry, of course, we had the three-year system. And my focus was that, yeah, duration is very important, okay? So I will not downplay that. But time use is even more so. In 2013, we had 27% absenteeism among teachers. It was a study done by UNICEF. And I remember reading that report and, and panicking because I'm coming from the university and I couldn't imagine 27% of my faculty not showing up at all. What do the students do? What kind of report, what, what kind of performance are we going to get? So you look at that and you tell yourself, and you also look at the results. Yeah, they are not so good, but they can get better. So you, I ask myself, okay, if these are the results we are getting with this percentage, then imagine if the absenteeism went down, you see? And it, that we knew because there was a report. But we also wanted to find out, or I wanted to find out, among those who even bother to go to school, mm. what is the percentage of their time that they spend on actual teaching? Okay, so the study that we requested to be done by the University of Cape Coast showed us that the time spent on task, national average, so meaning that it was worse in certain situations. Mm -hmm was 35% of the time. So 35% of those who go on the average, of course, some do more, some do worse. 27% yeah. absenteeism, 
then really it means that these children are super bright. It means that really if you can raise the time spent on tasks with 60 or 70 and reduce uh, teacher absenteeism, and what else? The textbook ratio, for example, was three children to one book. We raised that to four books to one child. We reduced teacher absenteeism from 27 to seven. We were not able to measure the time spent on tasks at the time we were leaving, but we had operationalized the National Inspectorate Board, and that was one of their jobs to measure that for us. And actually, I kept telling my team, that is my two deputies and the chief director, that, you know, these are not the kinds of interventions that give you um, instant results, so we shouldn't give up. We should just keep doing the right thing. And I was very surprised that even before we left the ministry, the results had already begun to show. Okay, so these are some of the things that you do to ensure that uh, the children are getting the quality. So some say the output we were getting was not just a result of the hours spent in the senior high school, and that it was a problem from the basic level essentially. So we were shifting the problem from the basic level to uh, you know the something? secondary level. I've taught at the university, mm -hmm. and every time, we used to do that too. But my counter argument over the years, and into the position of vice chancellor, has been this. The student has come to you because the student doesn't know. Okay. You should ensure that by the time the student leaves you and goes elsewhere, another person doesn't say that the university didn't do his job. We can keep passing the back. So yes, the secondary school should have done that. Yes, the JHS should have done this. And the primary school should have done the other thing. And actually, it's the fault of the KG. <laughs> now it's the fault of the parent. What problem will be solved by that kind of argument? Yes, they've come to you. They come with something. You know, they don't come with empty heads. They come with something. You are serious about teaching them. You'll do some diagnostic study of your class as a first lesson to see where you think the gaps are. And you factor them into what you've planned already to make sure that you are, fill, you are plugging the gaps and that you are moving your students along. And I think that can happen at any level. So yes, a child has come to KG, doesn't speak English. He doesn't have to speak English. Is that the reason why he has bad grammar? Maybe not. Do you get it? Yeah. So yes, you can. And so uh, duration, as I said, is important. But equally important is the, how you make use of the time. If, for example, in a set in school X, school reopens, and we've all experienced that. For the first two weeks, sometimes for a whole month, classes haven't begun. It is time spent. It's time gone. And two weeks before the exam, there's revision. You see, <laughs> the syllabus has been spread over the timetable. The timetable is not an arbitrary thing. It takes into cognizance the, the syllabus. So whilst you lose time back and forth, you cut down on the actual time that you need to, to, to teach. If, for example, the NEA, the National Assess Education Assessment Report comes, and we hear that oh, only 2% of our children in P4 can, can read, you don't go making primary school longer. You rather look at the competency of the teacher. Is the teacher trained? Are there books? Is the school environment conducive for learning? Does the head bus understand his role? And so on and so forth. So you look at all these areas, put them together, and you don't look at only one thing called the duration. So that is what I'll say about that. And in terms of the secondary school, you see, in my day, I don't know about yours, <laughs> the first degree was three years. Mm -hmm. It was three years. Do you know why it became four years? It became four years because one year was truncated from the senior secondary school. It used to be O level five years, and then sixth form two years, seven years. Yeah. Now we have three years GHS, three years SHS, six years. So only one year was missing. But that one year was added to the university program. And it was supposed to be like a buffer year. It was supposed to be like a remedial year. We were supposed to study the syllabus. We were supposed to um, determine the levels of the students and fill in whatever we thought was missing for the, for, for the you know, uh, on the part of the students coming to the universities. So if you add one more year to the junior 
uh, to the senior secondary school. A principal, so what are we supposed to do? Remove the one year from the university? But uh, if you look at the, um, all the reforms in this country, from the Gagis bed right down to the last one that was done by Professor Namo Mensah, the running theme is duration. So that children spend too much time. So, you know, so then it looked like we're even contradicting our own selves. Mm -hmm. So what I'll say is that duration is important, but equally important is the training of the teacher. That is key. The competency of the teacher is very, very key. The uh, availability of learning materials, whether it's equipment or books or space, they are all very important. The learning environment is very important. The relationship between students and teachers are very important. The relationships among students, they all aid in learning. Mm. So we need to look at all of this. And that was why you remember that apart from the, um, the Best Teacher Award, we introduced the Best School Award because we thought the environment has something to do with academic output. So these were the soft areas, the gray areas, the qualitative areas that also needed attention. Mm. I know that hardly attracts the attention <laughs> of the press <laughs> or of the journalists, but <laughs> we didn't work for that mm. as much as we thought that. Let us do the right thing and um, let us hope for the best. You, you, I'm glad you made mention of um, senior secondary education and Professor Anamo Mesa and his, uh, some of his research and his roles and proposals and the like. Um, he, he also recently came out with a, a report, his committee, a Professor Anamo Mesa committee came out with a report suggesting that uh, looking at uh, this implementation of free SHS and how it is that we are uh, implementing it, we would have to look for an alternative, look for a way out. And their suggestion or their proposal was that we go for a double track system. And so government has decided to roll out this double track system in September. Of course, it's come with its own challenges. But first and foremost, let me ask your take on that proposition in the first place. And then perhaps you can look into the other areas of this double track system and the implementation of free SHS no, as but a But you've whole. already said that the decision has been made. Yes, but so Th that's it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it because the government has taken a decision you don't have a position on it no but you see when the decision is taken and um i don't know the process that led to the decision maybe what engagement was done with the public with, with what types of public and how it you know it ended up in the double track system i'm not sure therefore I will not comment on that. What I'll say is that um, it's, it's a very new way of running the secondary school system. Uh, we've had a system that we have grown over how many decades? And again, as I said at the beginning, in terms of the junior high, uh, senior high school, um, for some of us, is a study of what, what problem is being fixed now beyond everybody going, okay? What alternatives did they have? What choices? And what accounts for zooming in on this one? I think that kind of conversation will be very, very interesting, okay? Um, from, the, from the information I have is uh, two streams will be admitted at the same time, mm -hmm. but they'll take turns using the same facility. Yeah. So the facilities are engaged all the time. Mm -hmm. What I know we did at the university to deal with numbers was to introduce distance learning and also to introduce sandwich, sandwich programs, programs yeah. so that the, the, let me say, the regular in quotes group doesn't have to go and come back, even though they were older. Mm -hmm. But uh, it would be attractive for those who were working not to worry about leaving the, their work, their families, the other obligations and coming to campus for four years okay so th that was a way in which at the university we dealt with this this is not a similar option I, I, i'm not sure it can't be a similar option because unless i don't have the information right from what i gather let's say group a goes for for about uh, two and a half months or so good and then they come home for the same the number same of period, days. about two months good and then group B goes, and at some point the two groups will meet. To write exams. 
Okay, for so they'll use the same space. The same facilities, yes. Okay, so uh, so it's possible for all of them to use the same space. You know, so that is why I was hesitating, mm. uh, commenting on it because I'm also trying to process this. If you were the education minister, what would be your strategy my in dealing strategy, with the numbers? My strategy, my strategy would be what I was doing: building new schools, expanding. You see, we picked 125 existing secondary schools and expanded them. We expanded them through, if they were boarding, provision of boarding facilities. Just go to Presec, you see the assembly hall built there. Go to Achimota, there's a girls dorm there. All of these were part of the, so many, as I said, 125. Some of the schools didn't even have kitchens. And I went, I, I don't know how many schools I visited finally in the four years. But I'll tell you about that later on. <laughs> Some didn't have kitchens. The women were cooking under trees. and I, I, It was terrible. OK, so you had to provide a proper kitchen. You had to provi provide proper dining room for the students. Some didn't have science labs. And science is compulsory. <laughs> you don't need to wait for the results or even ask what's your performance history in science. You know, so yeah. all these had to be provided. And that's what I'll do and continue with the new uh, but in if you fact, have been confronted with the issue of free SHS, the introduction of free SHS, and yes, the but then you see, as a numbers, minister, you also advise your president. So okay. you think you, 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 are, oh, you think Napo failed to I, advise I the president? I will not comment on his performance. Okay. okay. What I'll say is that you also advise. Beyond advising, you also strategize. You discuss, and then you implement. Okay. So what we did was to implement the progressively free. So we did not begin by going nationwide. Okay, I was never given the impression that we had unlimited resources. Okay, so what we did was to target the interventions. Where is the need mostly felt? So where should the support go? How many of the children in the F cube category are ending up in the secondary, secondary schools? School. What percentage do? What percentage don't? Mm -hmm. Why don't they? So where should your resources go? Do you get it? So these are some of the, of the targeted interventions that we have. And if I'm living in this community and there's a secondary school, um, maybe not so close by, but you know, when I heard the comments about, oh, the schools are far away, I asked myself, if you remove that school, which would have been the next one? Maybe much farther away. <laughs> why, did, why wasn't that a, bo a, a bother to anyone? We didn't care about that. We should care at all times and be consistent. That's very important. So you think it's just about the politics that people have been criticizing John Romani, Mahama and his interventions in the educational sector over his, period, over his tenure as president? I'm not sure. No, what, what were our crimes? I may want to know. What were our crimes in education? If we know them, some of us feel we can learn all the time. So criticism doesn't bother us. As aspiring scholars, that's how the work we do. Okay, I'll, I'll bring okay. back this issue. I didn't really want to <laughs> dwell, dwell so much on it, but I'll bring it back. And um, uh, the current minister, current education minister, your successor, uh, suggests among other things you were, well, I mentioned earlier, a disgrace as a minister. That's what he <laughs> says. And these are the, some of the things he cites in describing you as a disgrace. Uh, are you a disgrace? As far as <laughs> being a minister is concerned. <laughs> You see your performance <laughs> as that. As that. You, you go on. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> he talks about a number of debts, for instance, uh, you left. Uh, feeding <laughs> grants for colleges amounted to 36 million Ghana cities. Feeding grants for special schools, 4.7 million cities. SHS subsidy, 24 million cities. Progressively free senior high school debt of 33 million cities. Capital grant, 8 million cities. Get fund, 3.7 billion cities. <sighs> you see, I'm sure he'll find soon enough that at any given time, there'll be debt at the ministry. If he left the ministry today, I don't think every bill that walked into the ministry would have been paid. In terms of payments, what does the minister do? You write to the finance section. I'm not passing the buck, but it's a, it's a collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. There's no point where, I'm not even sure about, um, you know, I don't want to personalize this. But I would like to believe that whatever policy that comes, you put money to it, you do your budget, 
monies are released or they are not. Um, and definitely there'll, there'll be unpaid bills at any given time. Do you time. think that was a fair comment by your successor? No, no you know I've tried to I stay. I, I know you have this. tried to yeah. stay. But so because, you know, I, when, when this comment was made and, and it made a lot of headlines all over the place, I, I spoke to some people, some very... Uh, influential people in society. They were telling me you were their lecturer. So I think one of them said you were his lecturer. Um, and he was he was taken aback by what he heard. And he, I mean, he said a lot of things to suggest that it cannot be true and it, it, it cannot be the case that you don't know Listen, what you're Listen, I have been, at the, I've been in education for a bit. I've played my role in many, many capacities whether as Hall Walden or head of department or dean or vice chancellor or minister. Um, I'm not the one to grade myself, but I can only say that I do the best I can. Uh, the comment that, oh, I was a worst minister, a disgrace and so on. You know, worst is a comparative word. So it would have been nice for me to get his report on the study he's done of all the ministers who have ever come to reach that conclusion. But I didn't want to go antagonizing. I didn't think that would add much value to education. You didn't think it deserved any attention? It's not about that. I didn't see the point. Because I thought that if there was something he didn't understand, he could have called me. And insofar as he didn't and decided to go public that way, I don't want to join. W was he confused or under pressure based I don't on know, all the things that I were happening with the implementation of ESCs? I cannot like speak for him. I don't know. Mm. Whether he was it was for such a thing to come out of the blue to just... Well, it's, 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 it's up to him. <laughs> I wish him well. Because, you know, education has to succeed because our children must succeed. Two things happened when that, those comments were made. One was uh, um, someone who had been in your shoes, Betty Modi Drisu. Um, she came out to defend you and to suggest that, no, those were very despicable things to have, uh, for, for Napo to have said about you. Soon after, we got a statement from Joyce Bauer Mokhtari, a statement from the office of the, uh, the former president, John Dramani Mahama, also defending you and, well, going all out to attack the personality <laughs> of, of this gentleman. How, how did you feel that you had so many people to, to stick their necks on the line for you to say, oh, oh, yeah. no, we... Listen, I got so many emails, so many phone calls. It, it was, I, I, I was grateful to all of them in the sense that maybe the current minister is not the only one who can make any statement about me. Um, as I said, I worked in many capacities. I've worked at the, national, at, at the institutional front, at the national front, at the international front, and a lot of my international colleagues were totally outraged. And I just told them, just take it easy. These things happen sometimes. You know, so I had so many people who really couldn't understand. Most of them asked, did you say anything? Did you provoke him? You're not the kind of person. What happened? And I said, please ask him. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's quite interesting, <laughs> though. You, you, you try as much as possible not to say anything to offend anybody. No, it's not about offense. I don't uh. see the point. Maybe let me put it that way. I don't, what, what does that aid? How does that contribute to education, that two ministers of education are throwing insults at each other. <laughs> I don't think that's helpful. You're saying you wish him well. Is that a sarcastic thing? I wish education well. It's very important. But do you wish him well? I wish every human being well. You wish him well. I'm talking of Napo. You wish He's him well. He's a human being and I wish him well too. You wish him well in, in the discharge of his duties Why as is that education so important? minister. Move <laughs> to another topic. <laughs> Why is that so important? <laughs> <laughs> Which okay. of the problems in education does it solve? Tell me, you well, tell me. Uh, you <laughs> no. can't say it, so move on. Immediately does it solve me <laughs> uh, now. Uh, not immediately, <laughs> how about in the long term? <laughs> but yesterday, when uh, I, I spoke to you about a dialogue uh, on education and this VSHS policy and the implementation of this double track system. And uh, one of the things that came up, we had representatives of CHOPS, uh, they came out to suggest that if government should go ahead with uh, the implementation of this policy and not give give an give an eye or give give attention to all the things they have said, the concerns they have raised, this is what's going to happen. Two hundred and fifty of the private senior high schools in Ghana may likely close down, and ten thousand people may lose their jobs. 
How does that come to you from where you sit? <laughs> <laughs> What's your question? <laughs> Let me just take you back. Mm -hmm. um, when the whole subject started, I got a lot of calls from your colleagues. And I, I just said that um, if, you know, we, we need to look at the data. Let's say five, six years ago, mm -hmm. what percentage of the children from the junior high schools were going to the private schools? Has it dwindled suddenly? Is that why we have so many in the public schools now? So um, the private participation in education is sanctioned by the Constitution mm -hmm. 25. It is sanctioned. Yeah. So there's nothing illegal about it. Um, some have um, invested heavily in both infrastructure, equipment, and these are all there. So I ask that any reason why we cannot use them, why should we pack them all into the public system if we feel that the numbers have gone up? And if from what I'm hearing, some of the private schools are even closing down or turning the facilities into something else. So why, what is preventing us from using their facilities so that we can ease the pressure on, on the public ones a bit. So if that is what the, um, if that is what the private people are also saying, it's up to the government to work with that suggestion. Well, we, we are wrapping up, but uh, <laughs> I, I heard somewhere, I, I don't know how true it is or mm. otherwise, uh, about the possibility of you uh, going for a, a higher office if the opportunity avails itself. I'm told, for instance, that some people are considering you as a running mate. You are telling me for the first time. You've never heard of it? No. Really? Nobody has approached you with any such offer? How many times do you have to prove <laughs> <this time? laughs> <laughs> you, You've never heard of any such thing? I've answered you. Wow. So you don't know if someone wants to make you a vice president of the republic, if given the nod. <laughs> I've answered you. <laughs> would you want to be vice president of the republic? I, if I given don't know. Chance? I don't know. You don't know if you would want to be? I don't know. You seem to know uh, a lot is about it, Is it an offer you? you are giving me? Well, I'm not, I don't <laughs> so plan on becoming president. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but <laughs> you see, uh, it, it's because a lot of people talk about the, your diligence when it comes to your work, particularly. Um, of course, some say the politicians try to take advantage of that, and you know, of course, you do the the diligence thing, and then the others will do whatever it is they have to do. But because people revere you, they may not necessarily, you know, <laughs> uh, throw certain things at you. Oh, I see. Uh, that, that that that's what I have heard from. Oh, okay, you hear a lot. Indeed, we are journalists, <laughs> so we do a lot of fishing and digging. As we, but so you're not considering any any political office in the coming years. So I'm saying, for instance, the NDC is going for its elections in December to elect a flag bearer. The flag bearer will have to choose a running mate. And like you, I said, you, one of the you know names what I you had remind had. me of. You remind me of my classes in research methodology. <laughs> Especially when we are in, when I'm teaching interview <laughs> skills. Okay. <laughs> so listen, <laughs> you pose a question. Mm. Your respondent gives you a clear answer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unless you went to the interview with your own answers in mind, I, I don't but have your respondent gives you a I, question, I don't have any and then you in want mind. to put the same question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any answer in mind. But I, I just I just wanted some clarity from you on those oh, issues I, I, and the I, like. Uh, as I said, I'm hearing from um, I'm hearing it from you for the first time. Mm. Mm. But you have no such intentions. You, you're right. Not keen you on asked that. me what I was doing, and 